Hi everybody, welcome to Phoenix Fiction Writers Podcast Episode 5, where it is our mission to write, read, and discuss science fiction and fantasy that encourages and inspires its readers. I'm Hannah Heath, writer of YA Christian Speculative Fiction, author of The Terebinth Tree Chronicles and Skies of Dripping Gold, and the Multimedia Manager for PFW. I'm joined today by fellow PFW authors Kyle Robert Schultz and Nate Philbrick. We are going to discuss how our love for Star Wars has made us better writers, which is exciting because we all love Star Wars. But before we get into any of that, let's meet our PFW authors this month. Uh, Nate, do you want to start off by introducing yourself? Sure. My name is Nate Philbrook. I am the social media manager for Phoenix Fiction Writers, which means you will see me running the Twitter and Facebook accounts for the most part. I write adventure-based fantasy novels. I do prefer to shy away from certain fantasy uh, staples. I usually don't include a whole lot of magic in my stories, but I still consider it fantasy. Uh, my debut novel, Where the Woods Grow Wild, is available on Amazon as of 2016. And right now I'm currently working on The Broken City of Crows, which is a serialized novel on Wattpad. So obviously it can be read for free at any time. And it's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Kyle, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Kyle Robert Schultz, and I do blogging and book reviews for Phoenix Fiction Writers. I write fairy tale fantasy in unusual period settings like uh, 1920s London and the Old West in a big shared universe similar to something like the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And the two, the two series I currently have available are called Beaumont and Beasley, which is on Amazon, and Crockett and Crane, which is currently available on Wattpad and will soon start being released on Amazon as well. All right, so now that you know who we all are, we can get into our news section where we talk about um, any kind of interesting book launches or news or anything that any of our PFW authors have. So, uh, Nate, do you want to kick us off with that? What's going on in your writing world? Not, not too much new. Uh, I believe we mentioned in a blog post or something that I launched a new website back in April, www.natefilbrick.com. And it's not going to be a blog set up. It's just more of a static hub for all my online activity. But I do have a newsletter. That would be the big announcement, quote unquote. Uh, so I, I think those would really be the only updates on my end. Cool. Yeah, your website is really cool. Did you end up doing it through WordPress or Squarespace? How did you design it? I weighed my options and I, I checked out some review videos of both options, but I did end up going with Squarespace. I, I felt it was more tailored to what I wanted to do. And I had already used WordPress in the past and I wasn't quite as thrilled with it. So I decided to go with Squarespace and I, I'm pretty happy with it. it. Turned out really nice. I like how it looks, very professional. I appreciate it. Um, all right, Kyle, you can tell us about all of the stories you've written since last month. I'm sure it's like 15 <laughs> or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, not quite as much as I'd like, but I have written quite a bit. Yeah, I. Um, uh, so far, I've I've just been focusing this past month on the next book in the Beaumont and Beasley series, which is a collection of six novelettes, which I've released individual synopses and covers for on my blog. If you want to check that out at Kyle Robert Schultz with no C dot com. And uh, also right now I am working on getting Horseman, which is the first book in the Crockett and Crane series that I have had on. Wattpad previously, I am going to release it on Amazon this Friday, May 25th. So that's my big news for right now. And I'm just kind of still gearing up for Beaumont and Beasley Book 5. Have, don't have an exact release date for that yet, but it's coming soon, hopefully. Yay! Awesome. Um, so other PFW writers actually have some really cool news. Um, E.B. Dawson just did release the cover for the creation of Jack Book 3, and it looks really cool. Have you two seen that yet? Yes. Yeah, yeah that was, it is. Nice. It's pretty great. Yeah. Yeah, I'm very excited. I think she also released the synopsis, and that also looks really exciting. Mm -hmm. And also vaguely Yeah, stressful. I need to catch up on that series. I haven't... I haven't actually read the first couple of books, but I really need to catch up on it. It sounds really cool. Yeah. I need to start it. Oh, 
It's so good. So I'm very excited. But also the synopsis kind of stresses me out just as a fan because I don't know what's going on with the characters and <laughs> yep. I want them all to be happy and I don't know if they're going to be. So we'll see. Um, Those are definitely on my list. Yeah. The other piece of news is that J.E. Parazzi is releasing the episode three of the Raven Tree Society, which is titled The Coal Mansion, and that's releasing on May 23rd, so actually today, the day that the podcast is released. So that'll be on Amazon. We're going to link that below so you can go check it out because um, this series is phenomenal. So if you haven't read it, you should really read it at some point, (laughs) hopefully sooner than later. (laughs) That's one that I have read. (laughs) Yeah, that was I. I, uh, I was one of the advanced readers for uh, the third one, and it really, really is excellent. I have a review of it on Goodreads, and I'll probably feature that on my blog uh, on the release date. So that was really excellent installment. Very exciting. Awesome! I'm excited. I have a copy of it, and I'm going to read it hopefully today. Actually, so I'm looking forward to cool. that. <laughs> All right, so we can move on to our story time segment where we talk about um, any interesting writing news that we have for this month. So, Kyle, do you want to start with that? Sure, yeah. I guess uh, the interesting story for me, really, in a general sense, is just writing writing this anthology of of, uh, stories for this next, uh, and I think I might have actually been saying book five when I should have been saying book four of Beaumont and Beasley. I've been doing that all week. I meant book four. I'm also working on book five, but but I, I'm talking about book four. That uh, has been an interesting experience because I've sort of broken out of the usual mold and I've been doing individual stories focused on groups of characters, which I have to admit has partly have been inspired by Infinity War because that was done so well in there, kind of breaking characters off so you can examine individual relationships. So that has really let allowed me to delve into my story in a way that I haven't been able to before. So it has taught me a lot, just this process of breaking things up and really emphasizing things that were on the sidelines before. Awesome. Well, I'm excited about that because I also really loved that movie. So that'll be cool <laughs> to see that kind of emulated uh, that was awesome. in yours. Yeah. yeah, it was really good. <laughs> Um, Nate, what about you? Well, I'm going to start out with a no spoiler request because I haven't actually seen Infinity War yet. Okay. So, so uh, yeah, uh, if you spoil anything, I'm, I'm going to hang up and, and walk out the door right now. <laughs> but uh, I mean, I suppose that's my fault because it's been a long time. Anyways, as I mentioned earlier, I have been working mostly on the Broken City of Crows on Wattpad, which means that I have been writing and uploading at a pretty steady rhythm, so I don't really have that much excitement going on in terms of novelty or, or I don't know, events. But I, I was going to mention again that back in April, I received a message from a representative, I guess, of the Wattpad headquarters in Toronto, and they asked for a complete synopsis of the book, which I didn't have because I wasn't ready because uh, you never expect this sort of thing. But I, I wrote one out uh, in about five hours, got it down to three pages, and, and sent it off to them. So I don't know if anything's going to come of that. I, it's unlikely, but it is nice to know that some people have been seeing it and that it has generated interest. Uh, other than that, like I said, fairly uneventful month for me, other than me wrapping up the last chapters and outlining and being an emotional wreck. But that's just the norm. And I haven't read the latest chapters yet, but I'm I'm kind of like nervous about reading because <laughs> I've been I mean, seeing all the tweets you've I've been seeing all the tweets you've been making about them. Oh boy! <laughs> don't worry, I I may just be misleading everyone. No, I don't think so. I I I, I don't think so. <laughs> I'm fairly confident I've given nothing away. <laughs> See, I haven't had a chance to read any of this yet. So I feel like I'm just kind of sitting on the sidelines watching everybody freak out. And it's kind of you're, funny. You're a terrible person, Hannah. You're a very bad person. <laughs> no, that's no, all right. No, it, really, it really is uh, it's amazing. And uh, I'm not surprised that it has uh, attracted some interest at Wattpad, sort of the 
the HQ because I can see not only is it an excellent story, but also it has really drawn people in. I can see there's a lot of engagement going on, which I think is a testament to how useful Wattpad can be for authors. I know it's done a lot for my platform because I've gotten quite a few fans there that I haven't gotten uh, from other means. So right. it's uh, that's definitely, I think... Crows is definitely a huge success story for the uh, indie author in Wattpad. So it's very, very impressive. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. Uh, Hannah, if, I don't know if Wattpad is your thing or whatever, but the good news is that eventually there will be paperback and ebook versions of it available. So yeah, there's awesome. no need for you to rush over there uh, if you don't feel like it. Awesome, because I have been waiting and hoping that you were going to do that. So that makes me really happy. <laughs> yeah, that's the plan. Cool. cool. All right. And then keep us posted on what happens with that uh, Wattpad request, because that's exciting. Yeah, for sure. Um, so this month I went to Comic-Con Revolution, and for the first time I actually had a booth at one of these Comic-Cons rather than being the person walking around and asking questions of the people sitting behind the booth. So it was kind of this role reversal. Um, and I was not a fan, honestly. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was kind of scary because you sit there and people walk up to you and they ask hey what, what what's the story about and I'm sitting there thinking I, I don't know <laughs> I had a verbal pitch prepared but I can't remember it now so read the back of the book <laughs> please and don't talk to me because I'm an introvert so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so it was quite interesting but I learned learned some good tips and learned that it's really important to just memorize a verbal pitch and have it down and not it that. is yeah mm-hmm that's awesome, though. That's great. Yeah, so I think I made some good connections. We'll see. I don't know. It was kind of um, interesting because we, our booth was back in Cosplay Corner, and obviously mm-hmm. our booth, I was with a Constant Collectible, which is a nerd website that I write for, and we're not cosplay, so we were next to all of these cosplay booths and this random little <laughs> you know, nerd news website with some short stories, so that was kind of funny. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But yeah, it was overall... I, I see all the... I'm sorry. I, I see all the all the pictures and, and posts that you put on, and I, I'm going to fly over there one of these years uh, just to do a, a tour around the country to to see all these places and connect with you in person. Because I feel pretty awesome. stranded over. It. I feel I feel pretty stranded here. You are stranded there. I am. <laughs> it's a problem. No, yeah, no, we really want you to come over here and actually see you in person. This is the first time I've actually talked with you, other than by tweet or by email. So this is really cool. Right, yeah. <laughs> I need friends. <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome. Though. Yeah. Um, I actually picked up some cool artwork. I got a little gin or so. I know it's a podcast, so nobody can see this, but I'll just show you guys. I'll post it on oh, Instagram. That's nice. The podcast nice. With me. I like it. Nice. Yeah. Um, so anyway, it was a fun experience. Terrifying, kind of awkward, but uh, I would try it again. So, yeah. Cool. Yeah. So that concludes our story time. And now we can talk about the thing that we've all been wanting to talk about, which is Star Wars. So our topic this all month. Right. Yeah. Our topic is about how Star Wars <laughs> has made us better writers or, you know, writing lessons we've, we have learned from Star Wars. Um, so first things first is when did you first get into Star Wars and what drew you to it? Um, let's start with Nate. Yeah, I was thinking about this question and I feel like my Star Wars conversion story is fairly unremarkable. If I remember correctly, we were flipping through channels when I was about, I want to say nine or 10, and we happened to catch the beginning of A New Hope. My mom had seen them as a kid uh, in, in theaters. So we just kept it on. We liked it. Uh, and we. I think over the next few years, just ended up watching them all. And uh, I don't know, I guess I kind of just got interested that way. That actually sounds a lot like how I was introduced. It was just my parents showed it to me. And so I sat down with my brothers and watched it and thought, oh, spaceships, this is awesome. And then it kind of went from there. So Mm -hmm. (laughs) what about you, Kyle? I uh, am one of those people who didn't get into Star Wars until like ridiculously late. Uh, same thing with Harry Potter, but I, uh, I'm trying to remember what, I think it was when I was maybe around 
20 years old when I first watched Star Wars, uh, just because I'd been aware of it, but I didn't really become a passionate fan of sort of the speculative genre in general until I was in my early 20s, just kind of the way I developed. And uh, my family were not, my family aren't really big sci-fi fantasy fans, so I've kind of gotten into that on my own. And uh, I watched them in what many people would call the wrong order because I started with the prequels, which I do like the prequels. Um, Hmm. I, I dislike many of the same things that people do about the Phantom Menace, but I liked the good parts, and uh, that was really what got me into it, and then I watched all the way through, and over time, I sort of gradually continued to get more deeply invested into the universe. I think it was when I started getting really engaged with the Clone Wars animated series that I sort of realized, okay, I am officially a Star Wars fan. Mm -hmm. Uh, It kind of went from there. So uh, the, the mythology of the universe is what has always drawn me to Star Wars, just the, the incredible depth and, and all the different uh, aspects of it that are just, you can just spend hours discussing it, basically. Awesome. All right, so this next part gets a little bit controversial. I'm going to have each of us rank our Star Wars films in order of best to worst, um, but I'm going to preface that with uh, no yelling at each other, no disintegrations, no um, lightsaber fights, <laughs> nothing like that. This wasn't in the contract. <laughs> I didn't agree to these terms. <laughs> well, if you guys want to do that after the podcast, that's fine. As long as I'm not held responsible for any damages, it's all right. It'll make me change my mind about coming over there. <laughs> mm. All right, so who wants to go first with their Star Wars ranking? All right, um, Kyle, it is then. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so uh, my favorite is actually Revenge of the Sith, uh, which might be odd, but I, I really, really do love that movie. And after that, The Force Awakens, The Last Jedi, Rogue One, A New Hope, The Empire Strikes Back, The Phantom Menace, Return of the Jedi, and Attack of the Clones. Awesome. Um, that actually... That's a really good list. Okay, Nate, let's see what yours looks like. <laughs> okay, well, either the Force exists and is bonding us, or Kyle read my list because it's exactly the same. <laughs> really? That's... Or no, wait, no, I read Nate's list. Oh my gosh. Can we just <laughs> pre- start, okay. start from scratch? I, I was reading the wrong one. You might have to edit that. Okay, let's do this again. All right, so my... Favorite one is Revenge of the Sith. I really do love that film. Uh, And after that, it's The Empire Strikes Back, Rogue One, The Last Jedi, The Force Awakens, New Hope, Attack of the Clones, The Phantom Menace, and Return of the Jedi. All right, cool. So I'm looking at this list, and yours actually seems kind of in between mine and Nate's. So Nate, let's hear yours. Okay, well, I thought I was going to be really edgy and unique by putting Revenge of the Sith first, but Kyle beat me to it. It is also my, it's also my favorite, and it has been you know, ever since I first saw it. Second, I would put The Force Awakens, simply because it's the movie that kind of brought me back to Star Wars after the long hiatus. I started to lose interest, and that brought me back. Then I've got The Last Jedi, Rogue One, A New Hope, The Empire Strikes Back, The Phantom Menace, the Return of the Jedi, and Attack of the Clones. I'm not including the Clone Wars animated movie because I consider it more a part of the TV show. Mm -hmm. Got it. All right. So I guess I'm the only one who's starting out not with the prequels, so I'm going to go with The Empire Strikes Back, Rogue One, The Last Jedi, A New Hope, The Force Awakens, Revenge of the Sith, Return of the Jedi, Attack of the Clones, Phantom Menace. Did we all put Phantom Menace last? Oh, no, we didn't. Okay. Close, but not quite. Interesting, yeah. <laughs> this is funny that our lists are so different. Um, and then I don't think any of us have seen Solo yet, so it'll, we'll see how that falls in. Yeah, yeah, it's actually, I put a note about it here, but I forgot that it's not actually out yet, so it's kind of irrelevant. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm just determined. Yeah. I, I don't, I... Oh. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I'm determined to hate that movie because I wanted it to be an Obi-Wan <laughs> Kenobi movie, and it wasn't. I know. <laughs> Same. I'm not so passionately 
angry at it yet, but I don't foresee it jumping terribly high on my list either. Mm-hmm. Me neither. Yeah, that's about how I feel about it. I just, I don't know. I, I've seen the trailers. I've kind of been watching the buzz, but I'm just not really, I just don't feel engaged in that one. Well, we'll see, but I'm just, I'm holding this grudge forever. It's not healthy, but I'm just going to go with it. <laughs> so what to each of you makes your favorite Star Wars movie so good? Is it the characters, world building, um, plots? I know Kyle, you mentioned you like the mythology. Um, Nate, what is it that, um, what do you like so much about uh, Revenge of the Sith? Yeah, Kyle and I had the same one, so I'm curious to see what his thoughts are. For me, I, obviously, it's not a perfect film. A lot of people would argue that it's not even a good film, just in terms of the script writing, some of the acting. Uh, however, for me, what really makes it the best one is this emotion that it communicates. Uh, when I write or when I read, that's really what I'm looking for, that emotion from the characters and that connection with the viewers or the readers, whatever the case. So especially towards the last third of the film, for me, those were the most intense, I guess, maybe is the word I'm looking for, and the most engaging moments emotionally, at least in general. Uh, also, the sound of the sucker for a soundtrack. So that's always been my favorite. Yeah. Uh, I think those will be the two main ingredients that make it the best the best film in my opinion cool kyle does that kind of match the same reasoning yeah yeah really it does i mean for one thing i i love the music too i think it's amazing and definitely the emotion i think it it really that movie i kind of love it for its flaws and its good points is the thing I, i for one thing i'm a little nostalgic about it because uh, I watched it when I was really early and kind of discovering my love for speculative stuff in general, sci-fi, fantasy, whatever. I think in some ways I think Star Wars lies on, on the line between sci-fi and fantasy in some ways, even though it would be technically classified as, as sci-fi. And uh, not only was I really you know, falling in love with the, the world of it, but then um, despite some of the, what someone could say about the, acting and, and some of the directing decisions, the I still found the the concept of everything kind of going horribly wrong the way it did in that movie to be incredibly compelling and yeah. uh, sort of breaking all the rules about what happens in the hero's journey since the hero's journey does become the villain's journey there. And so I felt very emotionally engaged and I watched it again. I watched it like, so yeah, it must have been years and years ago, I can't remember how many years, and then I watched it again, I think last year at some point, and I found myself liking all the th- same things over again that I had liked before. I guess when I first saw it, I wasn't aware that you weren't supposed to like the prequels. <laughs> mm. So I didn't have a lot of cynicism going into it, and I think that it did have a profound influence on my journey towards becoming a writer because I realized what it was to, you know, get people engaged in the journeys of these characters that you come to love and then sort of seeing seeing that, feeling their emotions when something does happen and this, a horrible conflict does take place. And also the thread of hope running through that, I think, is very inspiring. So, yeah, there are some moments that you're like, uh, I'm not sure about this. And you could say various things about... Uh, the acting, especially, I would say, from Hayden Christensen. But it's important, I feel, that when you take that movie in the context of what has been done in the Clone Wars animated series and in Rebels, which is really significant, I feel, all of the that they've added to that, the, sort of the backdrop of that movie, it's different in context. You, you sort of have a, there's more behind it. It feels more significant. And some of the flaws are smoothed a little bit, I feel, by knowing that that exists. So that's one thing worth mentioning. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I was gonna actually gonna mention the same thing about the Clone Wars bridging that gap between the second and third episodes. I feel that, well, it's exactly like you said, I feel that it really, not only does it flesh out the character of Anakin uh, so much more than the movies ever did, but it really, it really sheds, especially Revenge of the, of the Sith, it sheds, sheds that movie in a new light 
I think, because you understand the character so much more having seen the, the TV shows. And then Rebels, after the fact, uh, adds even more of a retrospective effect uh, onto that, onto the way you view that, that story. So yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, and, and I think, uh, and I, I have to give, I have to mention her because she's my favorite character. I think that Ahsoka Tano, even though she doesn't show up in any of the actual movies so far, has a really important role in all of that because, uh, you know, part of what people didn't like about Anakin, I think, in the prequels is that he was kind of a jerk, uh, arrogant, and and that didn't connect well with some people. And, you know, one concept that I uh, read about a lot in craft books as I was getting ready to write my own books and also that I uh, experienced as I was writing my books is the concept of the care package, which I, th I think I found that first in a book by James Scott Bell. It's sort of the idea of giving your main character someone, an additional side character that they care about and that shows them in maybe a softer light, even if they have some traits that are not that, they're a little bit off-putting. And that's what I did with with my main character of Nick uh, in some drafts of the original original book. His little brother Crispin wasn't in the book at all, and he was a lot less likable. And so, and I was just kind of trying to cut Crispin out because I felt like he was distracting a, too much attention away from the other characters. But I finally gave up and put him in, and that was a really important role because it did soften some of Nick's rougher edges. And I think when you see Ahsoka with Anakin through the Clone Wars, and you just follow her journey through that all the way into Rebels, that adds a whole new element to who Anakin and subsequently Darth Vader is as a character. And it makes you see, I think that that actually fixes some of the issues with the failed attempt that George Lucas made at giving Darth Vader an adequate and satisfying origin story. Mm -hmm. Because you don't really, you don't connect very well all the time with his arguably sappy romance with Padme in some in some cases but with Ahsoka it's different there it's more like okay here's someone who it's not your standard cliche romance this is just somebody he doesn't have a romantic relationship with who he ha has a teacher pupil relationship and we see him more as a human being and less as proto Darth Vader yeah oh, absolutely I feel like we're bleeding into the next topic already but uh so far you're doing great Kyle keep it up <laughs> so good at segues because that's my least favorite part of this podcast so I should just let you take that part over because <laughs> what we were going to talk about <laughs> next was some of the best writing lessons and techniques we've learned from Star Wars so Kyle you've already kind of mentioned that like the care package yeah I'm sorry um, I'm sorry about that it just <laughs> no, that was it fits so well with what we were saying yeah. <laughs> it did yeah, yeah. so um but but yeah as far as other ones though besides that I think uh there's a lot you can learn about world building. Um, some of it, too, is I think you can learn some interesting lessons uh, when you look at how other people have stepped in to try to add on to what George Lucas did. And, you know, it wasn't always perfect, but uh, it's interesting. Some of the things that they put that they added to it in, for example, Rogue One or in uh, the Clone Wars or in Rebels, where they actually explain some inconsistencies and in actually actually use them as an opportunity to expand the world more. That's something that I've done several times in my career. It's very useful. It's, not, it's always good to not panic if you run into maybe something that seems like a major inconsistency. Try to see it as a storytelling opportunity and build on it to create a believable explanation. And then kind of along that line, the thing that's always fascinated me is with Star Wars is they do go back and fix some of those plot holes because they hear, you know, fan feedback. And they do take that into account. So sometimes you can see that they're relying very heavily on fan feedback. And other times they just completely disregard. Um, so obviously there, there are going to be spoilers in this podcast, just so everybody knows. But I'm going to spoil a part in The Last Jedi. So if you don't want spoilers, don't listen to this podcast. Sorry. Um, <laughs> but like with The, the Last Jedi, um, they just completely, they killed off Snoke without explaining anything. And fans really wanted to know what Snoke was. And they just decided don't want to go that direction. But with Rogue One, they were able to explain, you know, why is there a massive flaw in the Death Star kind of thing, which is something that had been bugging fans for years. So I always find it interesting that they're able to kind of weigh that out and decide what they're going to listen to and what they're going to disregard. And it ends up working mm -hmm. most of the time, except for them deciding to include Jar Jar Binks and other things. So. 
some things can't be redeemed. Oh, so bad. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, again, kind of going back to what Kyle mentioned about Ahsoka, she's also my favorite character. Uh, actually, before I go on, I should ask, are we worried about spoilers for the uh, last season or two of Rebels? Well, I haven't seen them, but I have kind of a rough idea of what what, what happened to them, so I don't really care too much about spoilers. Uh, I'm good with that. I'm I'm I've I haven't watched much past the end of season two. Yeah. Okay, but you have seen the end of season two. I have seen the end of season two. Yes. All right, then we should be good. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so going back to Ahsoka, she is my favorite character from from all of Star Wars. Very close second would be Obi Wan for obvious reasons, but I was going to mention just how great of an example of character development Ahsoka is, especially, I mean, she's not in Rebels as much, but in the Clone Wars and putting the two together, you see her grow from this annoying, uh, overly confident, very flawed teenage Padawan to a very capable uh, army commander towards the end of that show or that series. And then in Rebels, she's the next step. She's the leader figure, the mentor, the example to follow. And then she has room to become even more, uh, depending on what they do with her and and future media, which I don't know. But I think not only just to see her grow throughout the story, but to see her link different chapters of the larger story. I think that makes for a fascinating character that we see almost in, in snapshots or in glimpses but in a way that really shows how she grows and shows how she, how she changes. So I've, I've actually taken that formula, if you want to call it that, and stored it away for future use, you know, in case I ever write a book that covers that much or a series that covers that long a period of time. Secondly, I was going to talk about Anakin, specifically in Clone Wars. Again, this is something that Kyle touched on earlier, but I think seeing him as... He's really, he's really portrayed as someone that his army looks up to and admires. His, his peers and his superiors, they like him, not just because of what he is, but because of his personality, the way he connects with them. So I think that contrasted with the glimpses we see of the dark side coming out in him. Uh, I can't think of any specific episodes right now, maybe something like the, the Mortis Uh, sequence of of chapters where he gets this glimpse of himself in the future and he's horrified by it. I think contrasting those two sides of him really helps me at least visualize how much pain he's enduring emotionally as well as physically in the original trilogy, which is something that we don't see because he's walking around in this menacing 80s suit and something we don't see in the prequels because he hasn't gotten there yet. But that portrayal in the Clone Wars really drives home how how real of a character he is, whether he's Anakin or whether he's Darth Vader, because it's all it's all there, connected kind of simultaneously. And I don't think you really see that in any of the films because they're limited by what stage he's at. That's really interesting. So it sounds like for all of us that we are all drawn to Star Wars because of the characters. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think specifically, a lot of the Star Wars characters are very flawed. Um, Like, Han Solo is arguably a terrible person. Um, (laughs) Just Yeah, he he worked for some very questionable beings and smuggled things, and he's not a very good spouse or partner or sometimes not even a great friend, but then he has moments where he's just this really great person and he has some really strong points to his character, which I think the same can go for Luke, um, definitely for Anakin. Um, So it's just Mm -hmm. kind of, you see they take a lot of gambles with their characters where they give them these really unlikable traits, but they're always able to redeem them by adding some really interesting points, um, which has always kind of fascinated me. But I haven't actually seen Clone Wars or Rebels, so I can't weigh in on that. Um, uh, you got you got to watch at least Clone Wars for sure. Yeah, yes. Rebels is great. Rebels has some some amazing moments, but Clone Wars is just so consistently good. Yes, especially especially for those three those three characters: Obi Wan, Ahsoka, and Anakin. Okay. 
I did try and to watch those, and then Jar Jar Binks showed up, and I was like, nah, <laughs> I'm out. He kind of stops figuring after, I want to say, season three. You know what? If you're going to start on it, I would recommend, and I don't know if Nate would agree, but I'd recommend starting with the Night Sisters episodes, which are uh, in, involve the brother of Darth Maul. I'm not going to spoil it more than that, but uh, that is really cool, and... Uh, Lots of really interesting mythology, interesting Sith stuff comes in there. That, I think, is a great jumping on point to kind of get past some of the Clone Wars rougher earlier patches. There are some good earlier episodes, but like at that point, you're done with Jar Jar. Uh, then you're into really serious and pretty surprising twists with some side characters, and that kind of all leads into the stuff that uh, even becomes significant in Rebels. So... That's a good place to start, I think. If you really need something to say, okay, why should I be watching this? That is a good thing to convince you, I think. Seasons one and two, if I remember correctly, they feel more like kind of just in isolated entertainment chapters. Yes. I, I do agree that I'm trying to remember is where it really starts to continue a thread of art that tie into the main story more so than seasons one and two uh, so uh, and then four and five i think are probably the best seasons and then six had its unfortunate cancellation but yeah those three in the middle are, are fantastic and i would definitely recommend them another uh once you have caught up then to the end another a book that i highly recommend there's there's an ahsoka novel i haven't read it yet but i have heard good things there's also the novel Dark Disciple. I don't know if you've read that, Nate. Uh, it's an amazing book. It's based on uh, unproduced scripts of the Clone Wars, and it it closes out the story of Asajj Ventress, who is the apprentice of Count Dooku. Also involves the character of a Jedi Master, whose name I have completely forgotten. But a Jedi, a Jedi... Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Mental block. Quinlan Voss is a really cool character because he kind of is... In the expanded universe, he has always kind of been pulled between the dark and the light. So that gives some really unexpected character twists in there and with both of them that you really won't see coming. So I highly recommend that one. I have actually read the Ahsoka novel. I've got it on my shelf at, at home. Mm -hmm. It's good. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think it's essential. Mm -hmm. It does, have, I think its primary function is to tie off a little bit, the cancellation of the Clone Wars that we never got to to finish. Mm -hmm. The Ahsoka novelization isn't about that, but it references some events that help you figure out how that all ended right before the events of Revenge of the Sith. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, and I want to just uh, briefly pick up on something you mentioned. Is we were talking about the earlier seasons of Clone Wars, and also you were talking about Ahsoka's flaws, because I think that's a significant thing for authors to think about, especially right now uh, with, with writing, because uh, we see a lot of emphasis on strong female characters, which is great. But one thing that I think that we need more of is flawed female characters. I'm not talking about villains. I'm talking about female characters with flaws, because a lot of times female characters don't seem to have any, and which leads to the Mary Sue concept that we see associated with, for example, Rey. Uh, and I have my own thoughts on that too. But Ahsoka taking her journey in full, you know, she starts out and everybody, when the Clone Wars first came on, thought, oh, she's just an annoying uh, character who doesn't really have much depth and she was just put in there to attract children to the show, which possibly was true, but whether it was intentional or not, she, those flaws ended up having an important role in her character arc until they built into a really powerful uh, journey for her. So it's a good idea to make sure that when you're writing your female characters and you're trying to create good female characters, don't forget to incorporate flaws in the same way that you would for your male characters. Because I think some authors tend to not do that very well. A lot of them do, but but it's something to keep an eye on, I think, in this market right now. Yeah, well said. Yeah, I think that's... Um... I know the prequels get a lot of hate, but I think that's one thing that they did very well because in the original movies, it was very clear, like dark and light side, you know, Sith are bad, Jedi are awesome. But then you get into the prequels and then you start seeing, well, the Jedi kind of have some issues here. Um, a lot of these Jedi are, maybe there's 
some corruption going on here. The characters were all very flawed, so they weren't afraid to take these characters and show them grappling with darker issues um, and kind of showing more flaws in the characters. Um, and I do think that that's really important for any story that you're writing to make sure that your characters aren't all this, you know, they're perfect and they're always going to choose the light side and you know exactly where they're coming from. That's not, it's not bad to have characters like that, but you also need to have characters that are, um, act as a foil for that, who are um, maybe struggling with some more issues and are definitely more flawed. Yeah. On the flip side, again with Ahsoka, I, I think the opposite trend or the other side of the coin would be to have female characters that are defined by their, I almost want to say, an aggressive type of strength. Mm -hmm. People will frequently go to the extreme of saying, okay, well, I don't want my female character to look weak or like she's a pushover. So I'm going to give her all these combat abilities and have her be, you know, the punch first, ask questions in a few months type. <laughs> and I mean, obviously there's, there's a time and there's room for that. But Ahsoka, even though she at least becomes a very competent Jedi Knight, and she becomes a very skilled pilot and a fighter. That's not what defines her in the show. It's a very important part, but she also demonstrates a lot of kindness in the way she, she interacts with side characters. And uh, in any given episode, you'll see her helping people. You, you'll see her reaching out in a non-combative way. I think that's also important to keep balance if i'm going to uh go ahead and use the star wars word there <laughs> yeah i i definitely agree that's that's really that's really really important and i think that was something they did a really good job with um for jen urso as well as she starts out as you mm -hmm. think oh this is another one of those stereotypical badass female characters who's just you know very aggressive which is fine but then you see um a different side of her as the movie progresses and you see her come for love for her father and just the brokenness that comes from being left behind um so it's good i don't know what it is but female characters tend to only get like one dimension so it's that's one of the things that has impressed me with star wars is that they flesh the female characters out um like they would any other character which you would think would be common sense but it's not so that's really cool that they go that route yeah before i saw rogue one i'd heard a lot of uh criticisms about um and what's the, so I'm not getting this wrong, what's the name of the actress who plays Jin Erso? I should know that, but I... Ooh, I don't know so, that either. It's, um, I know this. Felicity something? Felicity Hope. Let me, let me just, I'm going to check that. I think. Quick. You, can, you can edit this out. Okay. <laughs> My money's on Felicity Hope. Felicity Jones. Okay. Ah, All right. so close. Okay. I got the so, O and the E right. <laughs> so before I saw Rogue One, I had heard some criticisms of Felicity Jones uh, acting as Jen Erso, or at least the character that she was too stiff in terms of how she came across and not very likable. But when I actually watched it, I realized her that early on, that kind of quality to her early on was all setting up for that moment where she sees the hologram of her father and she just completely breaks down, which, and you see the vulnerability underneath, which is definitely a testament to both the writing and Felicity Jones as an actress, because that really was very powerful and that actually worked as a character journey very well. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there again with flaws, you can see her flaws very clearly early on and then how she changed over the course of that movie. That's very cool. I'm very impressed with Star Wars' characters. Um, so now that we've praised Star Wars, let's talk just briefly about some cautionary tales that we've learned from the Star Wars universe. Uh, Nate, do you want to go first? I think it's really important to study the techniques that George Lucas used in the prequels, especially about dialogue, to really observe the the techniques again that he did the strategies and then to not do any of it uh because the dialogue in the prequels <laughs> I'm so I, I love revenge of the Sith, but the dialogue a lot of the time is pretty atrocious so you can learn by not following that particular example and then just the, the obvious ones to knock out not trying to shoehorn in an awkward romance story when maybe it's not helpful or 
Maybe don't cast Hayden Christensen when he's 18. <laughs> Actually, uh, sorry, I'm going to make a side note because I, I am very, I am very impressed with his acting in the last few uh, sequences of Revenge of the Sith. I think once he lands on Mustafar, he just he flips the switch and he really delivers. Yeah. Uh, so that's what I, would I, agree with I that. thought was phenomenal. But before that, maybe not quite so much. And then one thing for me is that Star Wars, as much as I love the world building, sometimes tends to be a little bit broad, um, specifically with, you know, you have the planet that's just the ice planet, and it's all ice, and then the planet mm-hmm. that's, you know, it's all tropical, and just it's kind of, they don't take the time to completely flesh things out. Usually they go back and do it in retrospect, which is kind of funny, but, you know, try to do it right the first time if you're going to build a world, put some thought into it. Um, that's yeah that's interesting from uh because on the one hand star wars is to be praised for the fact that unlike star trek which is terrible at coming up with unique uh looking alien species even though i'm sure they did a great job with cultures i'm just i'm not saying star star trek is terrible i'm just saying i love star trek but uh because of the limitations of their budget that they've had over the years there have been some some severe limitations on the kinds of aliens they could bring in. They've tried to fix that over over the years, uh, but Star Wars more so than that broke the rules and had all different kinds, lots of variety of alien life and environments and stuff. Which is partly just down to the fact that they had a better budget behind them even in the 1970s. Uh, but even so, then it's hard to to think about. Okay, really. What kind of, am I being varied enough? If I'm talking about a whole galaxy with all the different kind of things that could possibly exist. Am I really taking full advantage of this premise? So that is very important to keep in mind when, mm-hmm. when you're crafting something, especially something sci-fi with that many different worlds and planets involved. Mm-hmm. Um, any other last cautionary tales? Yeah, well, something I just thought of right now is the, uh, the effect, or I guess it's referred to as the stormtrooper effect or storm stormtrooper syndrome, which is something that I, I was mentioning with a reader of mine a while back, uh, just almost in a comical way. We need to be careful that if we're writing stories that involve, I guess you could say minions or grunts, that they don't become incompetent when the plot benefits from it. <laughs> it's a fairly uh, detailed note, not something you would really think of all that often, but it is nice to have some uh, proper name to call it by so that, you know, I think it makes it a little bit easier to identify that and then help weed it out of your of your draft. Mm-hmm. And I think specifically speculative fiction writers have fallen into that trope because it's done not just in the Star Wars universe, but in almost every fantasy or sci-fi universe so it's so easy to just fall back onto that but if you just take a little bit of time you can usually find a way around it mm-hmm. especially since we in the speculative realm have the freedom to not even make our stormtroopers quote-unquote people we can just make them like you know little monsters or whatever that don't even have to have personality or development but that doesn't necessarily help the story uh and as far as cautionary tales i think you know obviously let's just address the elephant in the room. The Last Jedi has been very controversial. Mm-hmm. Now, I'd be interested to hear, actually, before we finish, what Nate's overall thoughts on that movie are, because I have a lot of thoughts about it. But uh, I think part of the problem with The Last Jedi and something that authors can learn from it is the interactions between the creators of the film and the Disney company and everything and the long-term, long-time fans have not always been of the best caliber. Uh, There's been a certain degree of name calling going on, I think that has not helped to bolster the film's reputation and has distracted from some of the film's good points actually. And so I think as authors, we need to be very careful, uh, even though we are usually not working with an established property that's been around for many years and that that isn't even ours, in in a sense, we need to be careful in how we connect with our fans. Like, you know, I have one fan who, um, 
really doesn't like that two of my supporting characters are in a romantic relationship. And I do. So, <laughs> and I'm not planning on changing that, although something will be done about it, though possibly not what he wants. But <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, and, and I mean, he's a, he's a great guy and uh, I love his feedback on my books and it's not like he's been unpleasant about it, but it's just an opinion he has and I don't share it. And, but I'm not, it doesn't bother me, you know, and so I'm not going to get mad at him over it and I'm not going to get into an argument with him or anyone else who uh, who maybe disagrees with a direction I've taken as the author. If we don't want to change it, that's fine, but we also have to be prepared to be gracious with the people who don't agree with us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then also remember that you as the author sometimes can see the bigger picture and the fans can't yet because they don't know what exactly you have planned. So you just have to be able to have faith in yourself and that you're going to be able to turn something into something grand when the readers are just sitting there thinking, I don't I don't see where this is going quite yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a brief answer to your question about my thoughts. I, I liked it. I think I had it. Yeah, I'm looking at my notes. I had it third on my list of, of ranking the, the Star Wars movies. So it started out for me as my favorite for the first month or two after I watched it. It was it was number one, but then Revenge of the, of the Sith jumped back into that spot. It does have some it does have some plot holes. The whole Holdo uh, not telling anyone about the plan that that's a pretty obvious plot hole. I've seen people from a military background defend her decision basically saying that poe had no right to even ask her because of the difference in their military rank which to me makes sense but it could have easily been worked around by changing a few of the plot elements or even just a few of the dialogue lines and then also another big complaint is the whole casino arc I don't have as much of a problem with that because I think it serves to really nail down Finn's commitment to the resistance, whereas before he had only been committed to Ray. So maybe it was a little bit too long and a little bit too embellished, but I don't think it was altogether unnecessary to include that part of the story. Uh, so it, it is it is a flawed movie. It's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but I don't think it deserves the criticism that it's getting. My this is a whole other topic. My problem isn't so much with the film itself. It's with this person you may have heard of named Kathleen Kennedy and what <laughs> she's doing with the company. That's where I really get my feathers ruffled. Uh, but it's a discussion for another time. <laughs> Well, I, I agree with you uh, on that last thing. I won't say any more about it, but I strongly agree with you on that. And I also think your thoughts are really fascinating, especially about the the purpose, the, what, what, what the uh, Canto Bite, and I hope I'm saying that properly, subplot actually achieved. I never thought of it that way. So that's very significant because it kind of, in that way, addresses some of the issues with uh, The Force Awakens that, mm. that uh, Finn was just totally committed to Ray. So I'll be brief, but as far as my, my thoughts, I... I agree on pretty much everything you said. I, uh, I I think it's interesting about Holdo from the military perspective. I never thought of that before. I think that could have worked if they'd maybe added a scene in to say, okay, we're in the, this is a this is a battle here. We have military ranks and we have rules. That would have right, helped. Right. Uh, as far as the movie total, I liked what Ryan the basic concept of what Ryan Johnson as the writer was trying to do, I liked. I understand where he was going with it. Uh, I don't, other people felt like it was a betrayal of the spirit of Star Wars. I don't necessarily see it that way in terms of the storytelling. I think that he tried to do something good, but did badly in some ways. Mm -hmm. So if there had been, if there had been better development given to specifically Ray's arc and what he was trying to do with the mythology of the Force, I think it could have worked well. And it was, you know, it was daring and it needed some really good writing behind it and didn't always have that. So it's a kind of a shame that, that got buried under all of the controversy because there are some good threads there that could be worked with. And I hope that they are handled better in the third film of this trilogy. Uh, but I don't dislike it 
nearly as much as a lot of other people do. And I, I would say on the whole, I mean, obviously it's, it's fairly high on my list. So I actually do like it. And there are some moments, especially the ones with her and Luke, I think are really well done, really powerful mm -hmm. yeah. and really won me over even with the stuff I didn't like. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I think that uh, that moment on the rock where Luke gives Ray her first force lesson, that is already one of my favorite moments in all of the Star Wars, as well yes. as the, the fight between Kylo and Ray and the Praetorian, Praetorian Guard. That's just visually, it's one of the best sequences in the entire saga. So yes. if nothing else, we, we get those two little gems. <laughs> um, so can we go around really quickly and recommend Star Wars books or comic books or kind of outside materials that we think are worth yes. reading? Because I know that Absolutely. we all have some of those. So. Mm. All right, I, I have read most of the canon novels. The one Kyle mentioned earlier, I haven't read yet. But so far, my favorite has been the, uh, the Aftermath trilogy by Chuck Wendig. It takes place between the events of The Last Jedi and The Force Awakens. And it really uh, develops the fall of the Empire and the, the rise of the First Order in its place. So and independently of its place in lore, it's just really good storytelling. The Ahsoka novel was good. I don't think it's an essential read to bridge any lore gaps. Uh, it's worth a buy, in my opinion, though, just because she's my favorite character. The only comics I've read are the Kanan Jarrus comic uh, duology, I guess. It's just two, two volumes. Uh, Kanan is one of the main characters from Rebels, and these comics cover his backstory during the events of Order 66 and afterward. So um, I just picked those up because of, because of Rebels mostly. I have heard, however, that the new Darth Vader series of comics is phenomenal. I haven't read it. Hannah, maybe you have. I'm not sure. I have. But I've heard nothing good. but good things about it. Yeah, I'm, I am currently working my way through the uh, catching up on the Darth Vader comic because that's always been my favorite of the new ones they've been publishing. And that is superb. I think that that does a lot of what we were talking about before that it kind of adds new, it, it bridges the gap sort of between the prequels and the, uh, the, the original trilogy in some very cool ways. So uh, I highly recommend that one. And uh, like I said, Dark Disciple, that's an excellent book. Really, really astounding book uh that's one of the best definitely one of the best star wars books i've read one of the best sci-fi novels i've read really because it was just very satisfying and i need to catch up on the other canon novels as well but as far as uh, expanded universe stuff and this is more like not as expanded because it's actually on a screen but definitely the TV shows, I highly recommend the animated shows. And uh, I'm excited to hear that they're going to do a follow-up series now to Rebels. Uh, sounds interesting. It's by the same people who have done such a good job on Clone Wars and Rebels. So I'm hopeful it's going to be excellent as well. Maybe it'll have some fun mythology tie-ins like the previous two. I'm still holding on to hope that Dave Filoni will take Kathleen Kennedy's place on the throne That would Star be Wars. awesome. That would be uh, awesome. That would be the best. Yes, because he has excellent respect for the mythology, and I feel like he uh, cares about what George, that George Lucas's original vision, and does a great mm -hmm. job bringing it to life, but with way better dialogue and with uh, very intriguing, daring plot elements. Like, I mean, I don't know, I haven't seen the last two seasons of Rebels yet, but I have a rough idea of how it ended, and I'm really in, in, intrigued by the directions he decided to go in those last yep. few episodes. So I'm looking forward to seeing that. And when, when you see him during interviews or behind the scenes, you can tell that he's just another nerd. He's one of us. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Going back to books, uh, to flip the script a little bit, I recently, or actually last fall, I started reading Phasma, the novel of Phasma, which takes place before the events of The Force Awakens. And it's all about Phasma's origin story. I thought it was going to be really good, and I was really looking forward to it. I can't really recommend it, though, in case anyone out there is considering giving it a, giving it a go. It's just really, really boring. <laughs> I feel bad saying that, <laughs> uh, but it is. It's, I, didn't, I never finished it. And I feel like the whole story of Phasma is like 
huge expectations that never came right. to anything. And th- this ever, book since was... She was an, ever since she was announced, it's like, oh, she looks so cool. And then it's just one disappointment after another. She's just yeah. a British lady in a, in a helmet. Yeah, so I would have to second Kyle's recommendation of The Dark Disciple. It's an excellent novel. Um, That's really good. I don't know if either of you have read the Anakin and Obi-Wan comic books. Um, I have. I like that mm -hmm. one. I have. Yeah, I enjoyed that. I thought it added some interesting points to Anakin's character and Obi-Wan's, actually. So that was awesome. Um, And then also the... Revenge of the Sith, the novelization by Matthew Stover um, is really good. So if anybody just like really can't get past the acting in that movie, um, then the book is probably a good replacement. And it does do a better job with Anakin's character arc, I'd say. So that's worth a read. Um, Does Obi-Wan still get the high ground? He does. (laughs) Okay, that's all I need. I'm sold. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Let's see that. So many other ones. The Princess Leia comic books by Mark Wade. I know it got a lot of hate, but I thought it was pretty good. Um, added some really interesting points to her character. And the Darth Vader comic book that I think, Kyle, you mentioned that you're reading by Charles yes. Soule. Yeah, that's very good. Um, and then there was one other. I'm scroll- scrolling through my Goodreads list to try and remember what it is. <laughs> and I can't find it. Oh, well. Um, oh, the... Dr. A- Dr. Afra comics, they yeah. literally, they add nothing to the universe, as far as I can tell, but they're fun, so. <laughs> I like that character. Mm-hmm. She's, she's an interesting, I feel like she's sort of a in-joke in about Indiana Jones in some ways, but she works yeah. really well. Yeah. <laughs> Plus, I just love the idea of an archaeologist in space. It's just brilliant. She, of course, I big fan of River Song, so that works well for me. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Oh, uh, the other one was Vader Down series, which is different mm. from the Darth Vader series. Vader Down's probably one of my favorite comic books. I just bought that one, so I'm looking forward to reading that one. It's so good. It's just, it's Darth Vader at his most badass, and it's just, it's amazing. But he still has a lot cool. of his kind of Anakin characteristics, because it's really closely following Revenge of the Sith. So, it's cool. a really good one. Cool. Yeah, let me know awesome. what you think of it. Yeah, I'll, along, I'll review it. Along those lines, you just reminded me of the novel Lords of the Sith, which I would also recommend. It's it's not very complex in terms of plot. It's mostly focusing on the relationship between Palpatine and Vader after his transformation and everything, and it revolves around uh, an attack on Ryloth. So Cham Syndulla is in it, and a few other a few other cameos. But if you're if you're uh, into the original trilogy era and you want more of that dynamic between the master and the apprentice, that's a good place to go. I have read that actually, and I was not a fan, but I know a lot of people really? liked it, so check it out. I just thought I was really bored by it. Um, yeah, I haven't it, read it yet, but it looks really It drags cool. out, but, but it, it does some, have some good moments. It does, yeah. So I think it's probably worth a read. Um, it looks mm-hmm. cool. I haven't read it, but it looks it looks really cool. I think I'm going to give that one a try. Awesome. All right. So I think, um, well, now we get to talk about even more books because we're moving on to the book club <laughs> segment, which is the books that we're currently reading right now. So I currently am still reading Two Lives and Three Choices by K.O. Plus Pierce, um, which I was reading during our last podcast. I had to take kind of a reading break for studying purposes, but I'm reading it again and it's still awesome. Um, I just, yesterday I actually read Government Man by E.B. Dawson, which is a new short story she released, and that, like, everything that she's ever written was excellent, so, um, mm. yeah, but those are the only two things I'm reading right now. What about you two? Uh, I am, I think I'm still reading all the same things I was reading last time I was on the podcast, uh, because I usually read about 12 books at once, but just to make things interesting, I'll mention a couple of things I didn't mention last time, which is still reading the Spell, Smith and Carver series by H.L. Burke, and that one, of course, is, is awesome, and I'm also reading the Shades of Magic series by V.E. Schwab, which is very good. I'll probably have a complex review of it because I have many different thoughts, but overall I do like it so far. I'm about halfway through it. When I read Phasma back in October, I think it damaged part of my brain because (laughs) since then I've had a really hard time focusing on reading at all. 
Uh, so <laughs> from about October till just about March, I didn't read anything. No, no paperbacks, no ebooks, uh, no instruction manuals. But I did, <laughs> I did recently start to break out of my slump. Uh, I recently read The Inkling by KT Ivanrest and Colors of Fear by Hannah Heath, whom you may have heard of. <laughs> and both of them were fantastic. I left me wanting more. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Hurry up, Hannah. <laughs> Working on it. <laughs> and, uh, Halfway done. Other than that, I've been reading Kyle's Beaumont and Beasley series very slowly. I'm sorry. It's taken me so long. But, like, I, I our, read... fr- our friendship does not hinge on that. Don't worry about okay, it. Good. <laughs> Cause I'll, I take read, I'll read a, a chapter and then I'll just lose my Kindle for a month. and <laughs> it's, it's tough. Also, I've been a little bit better at keeping up with Crockett and Crane on Wattpad. Uh, finished the first book a while ago and have been catching up on the second book as well, which I like. I mentioned this to you a while back. I like it even better. So cool. I'm looking forward to finishing that. Thank you. Awesome. Well, good books are being read this month. Yay. Um, I think that that is all we have to say for this uh, podcast. So before we go, let's talk about where we could be followed online. For Phoenix Fiction, you can find us on phoenixfictionwriters.com or Twitter at phoenix underscore fiction, which, by the way, Nate, you've been doing an awesome job manning the Twitter. It's a lot of fun to read your tweets. Excellent. <laughs> yes. Um, also on Facebook. I at... demand a raise. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, you can take that up with Beth Dawson, I think. Sounds good. Um, and then we're also on Facebook, uh, just Phoenix Fiction Writers. Um, we are on iTunes and YouTube as well. And I think that is all. So, Nate, where can we find you online? All right, I am on Twitter at Nate Philbrick, and on Wattpad under the same username at Nate Philbrick. And my website really breaks the trend. It's natefilbrick.com. So if you're not sure where to go, just Google Nate Philbrick, and I've left my grubby fingerprints pretty much everywhere. Nice. What about you, Kyle? My website is kylerobertschultz.com with no C in Schultz. And my Twitter is Kyle. R-B-R-T Schultz because I didn't have enough characters to put the vowels in my middle name. And my Wattpad is also Kyle Robert Schultz with no C. Awesome. All right. And I am on Twitter at underscore Hannah Heath and on my website, hannahheathwriter.com. From there, you can find me on my blog and way too many other social media sites. Um, And yeah, that's it. So be sure to leave a comment below and tell us about your favorite Star Wars movies and Give us your rankings, because that's always interesting to read. Uh, favorite Star Wars characters, which um, that, that will be a no-judgment zone, unless you mention Jar Jar Binks, and then I will come on and personally attack you. Fair warning. Um, I think that that's all we have to say. Thank you so much, Nate and Kyle, um, for coming on and talking Star Wars. It's been awesome. It's been a blast. Yes, it was great. because We talked about this for, I think, three episodes, probably. <laughs> We let yeah, we're gonna we're gonna cut the recording, and then Kyle and I are gonna start slapping each other over <laughs> difference in opinions. Uh, but yeah, we'll just... yeah. So if if our social media accounts go silent for a couple for a while, then you guys know what happened. So come make sure that we're still alive at some point. That would be nice. <laughs> All right, but thank you again, everybody, for listening. Give us a th- thumbs up on YouTube. Leave us a review on iTunes. Tweet about it. Uh, share it on Facebook shout it from your rooftops, whatever works best for you. Um, We will see you next month. And again, thank you for listening. Bye.